Basically, my name is Matthew, and I am working on uh, working through Maze Lab at UKZN, and my work currently is on the ingestion, retention, and assimilation of microplastic particles in marine filter feeding fish. Um, that's quite a mouthful. So, in a nutshell, what's it about? I think the title sums it up quite nicely. Um, Basically, to recap the problem that you all heard now a lot today, uh, microplastics are a big issue. A very, very big issue, and they are a far-reaching and an increasing issue. But luckily for us, it's an issue that's now gathering a lot of scientific and even social and political awareness. Um, one of the most prominent sources of microplastics, uh, one that we can all relate to and uh, we're all guilty of, as I mean, Travis has mentioned and Deborah as well, is the microfibers from washing our synthetic textiles. Now, uh, we've all heard about how great you know, the synthetic textiles are and all the benefits, but obviously there's a darker side to them, um, in that every time we wear them, or even wash them or even wear them, they are shedding off these tiny little fibers. Um, up to 1,900 individual fibers per garment per wash, which is quite a thing if you actually try and picture it all. Um, what's worse is that the fibers themselves, like you said, are so small that they can't be filtered, so this creates a bit of a problem for us. Okay, um, microfibers get even worse as far as microplastics go, mainly because of their extruded form um, and their surface area. They tend to be more buoyant than microbeads of the same plastic. So they are going to be remaining available in the water column and suspended there for longer periods of time. Um, and we'll see this later in a bit of my results. So the floating particles then act as essentially very uh, efficient mechanisms for the transfer of persistent organic pollutants and heavy metals and other poisoning uh, substances to attach onto them and then enter into the food chain as they're ingested. Um, and because they are floating for longer, they're more likely to be ingested. So it's a sort of a twofold problem. I think that picture sums up the issue quite nicely. But once they've been ingested, what happens to them? We don't really know. Um, once they've been ingested by fish, do they stay in the fish's gut? Do they pass through? How long does it take? Um, do they move from the gut to the rest of the fish? So that's what we're going to find out. Uh, for the experimental work, there was some settlement velocity experiments, which were basically a bunch of observations, just putting different shapes and sizes of microplastics into different solutions and salinities, and seeing how long they remain suspended for. Then the more interesting stuff was the feeding of my fish, where after we'd manufactured all the microplastics like Travis and Jenna described, um, and incorporated them into the feed, we <laughs> I force fed them to the fish, lovingly, very gently, um, under sedation. And then basically we isolated the fish into individual tanks and let them go about their business. And samples were taken at time intervals to see when the microfibers were no longer present. Okay, so we took the samples of the water, analyzed them in the lab using UV light to see at which point the microplastics stopped being present in the water. Um, so what does this tell us to the important bits? Basically, microplastic structure had a significant effect on how long the microplastics remain suspended for. So the largest uh, difference basically between your microbeads, which are the ones that we've been talking about, the ones mainly ingested by the fish by sea ball, those tend to settle out quite quickly. So that's going to be indicative of a sort of a problem for benthic environments. Whereas your microfibers tended to, as your size particles are smaller, they stayed in suspension for the longest. And as the particles were bigger, they tended to almost clump together and form larger units. So then you sort of reach the peak and they started settling out again a little bit faster. Um, now that's what I said earlier about the this has implications for the biology of or the biological and ecological aspects because not only are they available to take up the pollutants for a longer period of time, but then they're available to the organisms for a greater period of time. Okay, so when we move on to the retention side of things, um, these are the results from my feeding experiments, and basically again, microplastic structure had a significant effect on how long these plastics were retained. Um, the longest time there was, as you can see, microbeads, but we're talking about like some of these were five millimeters. So for a mullet, if you can picture the physiology of a mullet about that big, passing a five millimeter bead, it was obviously quite a strenuous thing. So that was our, <laughs> our highest retention time. Uh, at the end, you can see in blue is the natural gut retention time. So microbeads, which are relatively the same size as sand grains passed out with give or take little difference. And then microfibers, again, were retained for twice as long as particles naturally should be. So that that's the third part of the problem is now they're available to absorb pollutants for longer, they're available to the animals for longer, and once they're in the animals, they're 
exposed it for twice as long for the pollutants to transfer across. Okay, so what does this mean for us? Well, basically, um, there's, further, there's a lot of further work to do. Uh, my work currently is focusing on seeing if the plastics are pass, bypassing the gut and actually moving into other tissues of the fish. Um, but for the most part, we, we need to consider the, the aspect of the persistent organic pollutants and how this can have serious ecological and commercial um, effects uh, if you consider the fish stocks of important species that are found off of our coast. Okay. And in a local context more specifically, the sun look quite well, we have a very high microplastic input um, into Durban Bay because of all the tributaries and the un, uh, untreated water. There's also a very high amount of persistent organic pollutants and heavy metals from the industrial activities that are happening in the area. And if you combine that with a large degree of subsistence and recreational fishing, we've got a bit of a threefold problem. And that's going to lead to problems, um, again, economic and human health issue problems. Um, so the question is, what are we going to do about it? And basically, I think it's a twofold approach that we need to take. And first off, we need to start at the source. Um, because like we've mentioned, once the microplastics are in the environment, it's very difficult to get them out. Uh, in terms of starting from the source, um, with microfibers and microbeads, I think there's a lot of work to be done in terms of introducing legislation to sort of place the responsibility on larger or the larger corporations and industry um, to manage what they're putting out there or to provide incentives, for example, for manufacturers of washing machines to figure out better ways of trapping the fibers. Um, stuff like that. And then the second approach is to take out the larger plastics that are already there before they break down. So get involved, clean up. It's about creating an effort, uh, uh, atmosphere of awareness. Like we said, um, our lab's involved in several beach cleanups. And it's just a thing about bringing it to people's awareness. Most people don't know that they, their chip packet becomes hundreds of millions of microplastics. Most people don't know that it's in their toothpaste, that it's in their washing, face washing um, products. So I think the number one thing we can do at the moment while we're figuring out the problem is to just spread awareness of the fact that it is a problem. And then, yeah, just to thank NRF for the money and UKZN for the facilities. And yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's the end of that one. <laughs>